where you can find out more information. Questions about membership, you can talk to him. We have weekly study groups uh, going on. Uh, well, one right now at here that's at National Instruments in another building. Uh, and I believe the current one is on the, uh, the cloud security professionals study group. So uh, if you have uh, questions about that, you can reach out to Matt Pardo, who is our education coordinator. Uh, and uh, our conference, LAFCON 2018, is coming up and in less than 30 days. And uh, I was going to let Bankham talk a little bit more about that. Uh, who's been to LAFCON already? Fantastic. Who's bought their tickets for this year? Not so fantastic. Uh, so we, we know this happens. Austin, everybody kind of signs up late. So... Uh, please sign up, it helps us to plan. Um, uh, another big thing that it helps us for is if you want a t-shirt in your size, like we have to put in that order in advance. So we can't do it the week before uh, and expect to get all the right sizes. So if you could uh, get your tickets for LAFCON in the next week or so, um, that's when we're gonna get everything in. So if, if you can ideally do that by next Monday, that'd be fantastic. Um, and we also have training. So we have four awesome training classes uh, for you this year at LAFCON. They're all two-day classes. And we've got um, Matt Tesaro, many of you know, has, has been uh, running this uh, AppSec automation class for a couple of years. Each year it's improved, added new, new content, new material to it. Um, we've got a great new class on whiteboard hacking for DevOps engineers. Um, and that's something that a lot of us are doing and taking on in our roles. Um, container security, serverless, and orchestration. Again, incredibly relevant to all of the new technologies and, and stacks that uh, we're developing with and that your, your customers and your partners and development teams are working with. And then attacking Windows PowerShell and Enterprise Active Directory, um, which uh, earlier this year we had a PowerShell class and that was totally sold out. So this is another opportunity if you missed out on that course to get some more attacking with PowerShell. So please sign up for any of those. Um, tickets are at the same place at lastcon.org and you can sign up for the training and the conference all together. Thank you, thank you. There is a free training on Wednesday, the uh, 24th, and there's a free OWASP Top 10 training. And what we really want you to do, for those of you who already know the OWASP Top 10, what we want you to do is to find your developers, your customers, your partners that you work with, who don't know about the OS Top 10 to attend the free training. And we'll get that invite out uh, pretty shortly. And a plug for the fantastic instructor, or half of the fantastic instructors, Josh, right here. Okay, thanks. Uh, upcoming chapter events, um, as far as training goes, yes, we're uh, I'm counting on our uh, last con pre-conference training is our next set of training. Um, I'm sure we're going to be looking at more opportunities for next year to have other training. And uh, the, as far as the Austin Security Professionals Happy Hour, we will start that up again in January. So just stay tuned for that. I just have listed here some other upcoming local events. Uh, and uh, I believe ISSA maintains a calendar, so this is a lot of this information is on there if you're wanting to look at other, you know, other meetings that you can go to to, to get educated. I'll just take a moment right now to see if there's any uh, anybody that has any uh, jobs that may be open that they want to announce. The Emmett Group has various openings uh, for senior level, entry level people, Austin San Antonio. So if you go to their site, the DNM Group, they'll just like the stuff that jeans are made out of. Uh, look it up, and uh, see if you see anything interesting, and go ahead and apply, and say that you found out about it from OWASP. Thank you. And now I'd like to present uh, Pranoy Day. The, he's uh, presenting on scaling your cybersecurity threat modeling.
Hello, 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 hello. It's kind of weird. Uh, can you guys hear me though? All right. Uh, this is a pretty big turnout for uh, OAuth, so that's pretty cool to see. Um, so, a little bit about me before we get started. Um, so, I am actually a software developer, and I started my career out as a consultant. And then I moved into the VFX industry for a bit, where I wrote a, a software that did effects for movies, worked on Avengers 2, so that was pretty cool. Uh, and then I finally ended up moving into the security space, and I started off as a network security engineer, where I developed uh, DDoS attacks, and we ran those attacks on clients, and then based on the vulnerabilities, made recommendations. And then finally, I moved into the application security space, where I now uh, work basically as a software developer for an application security product. So again, I'm not like a core security person, but I do work very closely with the security team, and it's a cause that's very dear to me. So it's always amazing to see so many people turn out for the same cause. Um, before we get started, I normally just like to get a gauge of what the audience is like. So I'm just going to ask you for a show of hands, like how many people here as core security practitioners, uh, developers, uh, management, senior level. All right. Okay, so we got a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool spread here. So the talk today essentially is about scaling your cybersecurity threat modeling, right? Uh, we at Security Compass, we've kind of recognized that this was something the industry was lacking, and we felt it was sort of a pain point a little while ago, and we started doing research along the same line. And our main goal was we wanted to see how we can uh, reduce the risk of an organization, right, uh, as they continue to grow without slowing you down. So we want to reduce your overall risk without slowing you down as you're growing. And uh, this was something we felt a lot of people were facing trouble doing. So we presented this research at the Conference Board of Canada, and that was attended by a lot of big companies, a lot of tech giants, so on and so forth. And a lot of people actually resonated with this problem, which was uh, sort of a validation for us that, you know, what we thought is a problem is something people are actually experiencing out there. And uh, some of those people actually came up to us after, some of these big companies, and they're actually working with us now in collaboration to further this research, right? And that's where this whole idea kind of started. So the outline for today's talk is going to be pretty simple. We're going to look at threat modeling the way it is today, and we're going to try to break it down and look at the different components. And we're going to identify the areas that actually stop you or slow you down when you try to scale the way it is done currently. And then we're going to attempt to put everything back together using a slightly different approach that we feel will help you scale quickly. So any questions about the agenda or anything else so far? So the way the research started, what we did was uh, we went out there to the who's who of the industry, about 26, 27 companies, I believe, and uh, we went and we asked them, how easily are you able to perform these activities across your organization, right? And we asked them to rate this on a scale of zero to five, where zero would be that they don't do this at all, and five would be they're able to do this across all their applications. And if you can see, we've highlighted that threat modeling ranks a fair bit below where it really should be. So it's much lower uh, than things like application risk classification, static analysis, dynamic analysis, pen testing, so on and so forth. So threat modeling is actually much lower than all of these things, which does indicate to you to some level that people are having trouble adopting this across the board. Right? So this was kind of the starting point that kind of got us thinking that, okay, so we need to understand what the problems are here. So looking at threat modeling the way it is now, and there are so many ways to threat model, right? When you, when you talk about threat modeling, it's a really wide term. You have so many different approaches. You have tried, which is basically the Internet Explorer of the early 2000s, where it's the most legacy way of doing it. A lot of people still adopt it. It's, it's the most sought after way of doing it. Uh, then you have more modern ways of doing it, like misuse cases maybe. And then you have Dread, which is actually backed by OWASP and powered by Microsoft, right? So there are so many different ways of threat modeling. But why are there so many different ways of threat modeling, right? Clearly, like, each of these things does something a little different. They have certain strengths and certain weaknesses. Some threat models are good at doing certain things, and some are not. 
And this is where we come into the idea that these threat models can be associated with certain attributes, right? So stride, for example, is a very formal way of approaching threat modeling. Uh, it's, really, it, it's like a technical way of looking at things. You have a, a detailed data flow diagram that comes out of it. You need some know-how. So it is, it is a very formal way of looking at threat modeling. Then you have some that are, that are not really looking at it from the formality perspective, but more looking to integrate within your SDLC. Now, if you guys understand, security was initially a very waterfall process, right? Back in the day, it was really invented. It was very waterfall. And the industry has grown a lot since. And now we have a lot of agile shops coming up, and that's just a new way of doing things. So security now tends to have a bit of a problem trying to keep up with the constantly changing requirements. So then suddenly we have things like misuse cases that come in that really integrates well into the agile workflow that's able to proactively keep up with your changing requirements. Some of these threat modeling approaches are a little theoretical. Now, not having to say that's not good and it's not practical, but it's just they were created for different reasons, right? So something like uh, Secure UML, for example, is a very theoretical way of approaching uh, uh, threat modeling. So you can take those learnings and pretty much even throw stride on top of it, which brings us to an interesting point where these threat modeling approaches are not mutually exclusive, right? You can use a combination of these to really achieve your goals. Uh, some of these threat modeling approaches also require a lot of technical know-how. You need people who really understand what they're doing when they come into the picture, right? Uh, to execute stride properly, you need someone who really understands data flow diagrams, the security analysis, all of that stuff. They, people need to know what they're doing to execute things properly. And along the same vein, some of these technical ones are very deep in nature, whereas some are very shallow. Now, the objective of an organization might be to just create awareness, right? If it's a very infant organization in a security posture, they don't care about fixing all the problems right now. They just want to get the conversation rolling. They just want to create some awareness. So a shallow approach might be best for them. Whereas someone else, like a mature organization, might actually want things tracked and maintained and fixed. So they'll need a deeper approach to threat modeling. And finally, you also have this whole idea that some of them are developed with an offensive approach, like something like persona non grata, is a very offensive way of approaching threat modeling. And whereas some of these other ones might be defensive. And again, not to say one is better than the other, it really depends on what your needs are as an organization, right? Like, what are you looking to do? So all these different threat modeling approaches bring something different to the table. And depending on what really suits people, they tend to adopt one or many, right? So along the same vein, each of these different threat modeling approaches also just tends to happen and work better with different phases of your SDLC. Uh, something like stride is great for the design phase. Something like misuse cases is great for the requirements phase, right? And then you have uh, Dread, which comes in on the audit side, and then you have uh, Chorus that can be on the deployment side, maybe. So you have all these different types of threat models that really apply to different stages of your SDLC, right? So what I've done out here is I've actually expanded Stride and Dread out on two sides. And uh, so Stride is basically spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, elevation of privilege. And on the right, we have uh, Dread, which is damage, reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, and discoverability. Now, straight off the bat, can you guys like identify a difference in theme for both these approaches? Anyone? What do we have? There you go. Like, What's your name, sir? Chris. OK, so Chris is pretty much the nail on the head. So Stride really approaches uh, threat modeling from an attack vector perspective, right? It's looking to see what the different attack vectors are and start modeling based on that as a starting point. Dread, on the other hand, is really focused more on a bottom line level, like something that adds business value, something that uh, a different team can uh, uh, resonate with, right? So they're looking at things like damage, reproducibility, exploitability, things that will give you an understanding of where your application lies on a business level almost. So the point I'm trying to get to here is these different threat modeling approaches have all been created with different motivations in mind. Right? So the goals that they tend to achieve are very different. Now, some of these threat modeling approaches are focused on security assessment. Some literally just want to generate requirements. Some are totally looking on the compliance and risk side. Some want to align things with the business needs, and so on and so forth. So we can go on and on about the different types of motivation and goals that threat modeling approaches are built on. And because these motivations are different, the artifact or the output that is generated from these threat models are also different. 
So stride is a formal technical way of threat modeling, which is focused on attack vectors, and the output here would be a data flow diagram, right? Something like misuse cases is going to probably be in user stories. Uh, something like Cora's is based on UML, but it's a little graphical, right? And then you have UML and secure UML that are basically UML diagrams. So all these different threat modeling approaches are contained in different artifacts. And if you remember, I did mention that these approaches are not mutually exclusive. So it's very possible and very likely that you guys are using more than one approach within your organization. So now with all these different types of artifacts, what are these problems that we're running into? We have these problems of data translation now. We have one team that's producing data flow diagrams on one side on the requirements end, and we have UML diagrams all the way on the other end. And now we have all these problems of being able to translate this information in a way where it's not being misrepresented, in a way where it's comprehensive, and in a way it is correct, right? So this actually takes a lot of man hours, and it's kind of serious in a way. And whenever you have something like this, it tends to slow you down when you try to scale, because now, the number of applications grow, the number of data flow diagrams are growing, the translation work is increasing, it might tend to become a bottleneck as you're trying to grow. So any questions so far? Or comments? Or anyone yell at me? Yeah. So if I understood the question correctly, you're asking what is the right approach to decide which threat modeling thing to use? So that's a great question. And it really depends on what your business needs, right? Now, for example, like Microsoft for many years, they didn't use Dread. They were focused more on attack vector types of threat modeling. And eventually what tended to happen was they were finding it very hard to convey the technical side of things and sell that to the higher up. And so they changed their philosophy completely. And now they develop bread by themselves because that helps them make a business case every time they need more funding on the security side. They're directly able to tie that with their business, right? Uh, someone else that's a very small company that, that might not be exposed to as much risk or doesn't have critical user data, they might not need something super technical. So it's pretty much a combination of your security posture, the size of your organization, the maturity, the sensitivity of the data you're dealing with. You have to take into account a lot of these different things and then pretty much decide as an organization what approach you need to go for. At least that's the way it's being done right now. Right? Uh, any other questions, comments? No, no, no. So, th so the idea that I was just trying to drive at here is that there are lots of different ways of threat modeling right now, and each of them have different attributes. And they're built with different motivations, they apply to different places, and eventually using so many different things can become a slight bottleneck when you try to grow. Absolutely, that's, that's the other thing. Sorry, what's your name? Bill. Bill. So I'm just going to reiterate what you said in case like people didn't hear it. Uh, so what he's basically saying, what Bill is saying is um, with so many different approaches in place, it not only slows you down, it makes it very difficult to convey all this information to another department that is not as technical, right? Decision making slows down, which is pretty much the point we're trying to drive at, right? The goal of this presentation or this research was started with the idea of allowing you to really grow your threat modeling without slowing you down or minimizing the slowdowns that you might face. So that, that pretty much aligns with what we're trying to go at here. Okay, so again, I want to reiterate our goal here, right? So I, I keep saying this again and again because this is something we truly believe in as an organization. So allowing you to really reduce your risk without slowing you down as you grow, right? So that's the goal here. So let's rephrase that in the context that we're in of threat modeling. We want you to be able to scale your threat modeling approach across the SDLC with no friction or with little friction. So this is our ideal state. This is what we want to achieve, right? And 
what I want to start off with, I want to look at a few very popular artifacts right now that are being used and discuss what some of the attributes are in those artifacts that might result in slowdowns as you grow, right? So we'll start with the most popular one, which is the data flow diagram. Now, state of the bad data flow diagrams are a very technical, a very technical box by itself, right? It's, it's got a lot of flows, diagrams, components, and there's a lot of technical jargon inside it. So translating a data flow diagram to other artifacts is actually one of the biggest challenges. It's a lot easier to translate a list or even a UML diagram or something else, but data flow diagrams are a lot more technical. So when that is being done on one end and you have a bunch of stuff on the other, that translation actually takes a little bit of effort and man hours, right? And then which pretty much brings, brings us to the second point, data flow diagrams are sort of tedious because they're done by people. Now, yes, I understand there are organizations that are a little more mature in the way they handle their security and there is automation being done in, in parts, of course, but by and large, data flow diagrams is a very manual process which also leads to the problem that it doesn't give you the same output all the time. Depending on who's doing your data flow diagram, you might get a different output, right? Um, and finally, the most important thing about data flow diagrams is this thing that we experience called the network effect. And this is a term coined by me uh, or my, some people in my company who are just thinking it's not a thing out there, so don't go Googling network effect. Uh, but what, I, what I'm trying to say is essentially, you have 10 components in your, in your company. Now you've added 11th component. And what happens is, in a data flow diagram, you have 10 ways of communicating with that 11th component. So adding a single component is exponentially increasing the complexity of your diagram. Now in reality, of those other 10 ways of communicating, six or seven of them might, might not be an issue. They might not be realistic, they might not, but you still have to go and analyze all of them to understand where you're at, right? So the complexity of creating a diagram is exponentially increasing. Now you have hundreds and thousands of applications and many, many components you're adding, so the data flow diagram just becomes incredibly complex to keep up and maintain. Another really popular way of uh, representing uh, a lot of these threat modeling outputs is checklists. Um, and checklists are great. Honestly, like I'm a big fan of checklists. My grocery lists are always checklists, never a data flow diagram. But the problem is uh, with checklists, what you run into is exception policy, right? Uh, now, imagine like you have a list of things that, that your application is vulnerable to, and now suddenly you go like, okay, this is, this is working for most of these cases except ca case X, Y, and Z, right? So other than this, it mostly works. But we also run into this other problem where we say, okay, so this is the posture right now in version 4.15. I think in 4.16, these exceptions don't apply, and I don't really remember what happened in 4.14 because I think there was an update there or something like that. And now you're running into all these different problems trying to maintain your versions and your exceptions. And as your application grows, this is just getting more complex and more complex and more complex, thus slowing you down when you try to grow. And finally, we spoke a little bit about misuse cases as well before. So the problem with misuse cases, and this is something that is not really just misuse cases, but it pretty much is the main attribute of misuse cases, is it's not systemic. It's not a holistic view on the threat, right? Now you might have, when you have a misuse case, right, and you, and you have this vulnerability, that vulnerability might be critical for that component. But are we understanding if that component is critical for your organization, right? Do we have this overview on top of it to really help us prioritize and understand what the realistic impact of that vulnerability is, right? So. With misuse cases, you have this exaggeration of importance that happens with the vulnerability. And now imagine your application has grown a lot and you have tens and thousands of misuse cases. You don't really know which ones are as important because you don't have an overarching view on top of it. Right? So any questions so far? Comments? So I just want to take a step back here, right? We've spoken a little bit, or we've spoken a lot about the current ways of threat modeling. And just like to look at what threat modeling is defined as right now, it's defined as prioritizing and identifying your potential threats and vulnerabilities. That's what threat model is right now. So to this definition, we at Security Compass actually feel that th the threat modeling definition by itself is lacking slightly in one area, which is it fails to provide the system-wide overview that we spoke a little bit about, right? Now, having a system-wide overview has a lot of benefits. It really helps you 
prioritize which areas you want to dive into more detail and helps you maybe even like if you're using misuse cases that you had the security blanket on top, you could speed things up by eliminating large sections that are not important to you. So we wanted to expand and we're hoping this idea of expanding the definition of threat modeling really picks up. So what are these new additions we want to make? Firstly, we want to make this addition of threat modeling really giving importance to a system-wide overview, right, number one. Number two, more importantly, what we also want to do is we feel the way threat modeling is, if we start associating a little more useful business value information with it, like risk, compliance, auditing information, along with those attack vectors, you are suddenly now bringing a lot more people under the blanket of security threat modeling, right? Now, your business side, your tech side, your DevOps side, your security side, everyone is directly becoming a stakeholder inside threat modeling, making it a much stronger force. So that's the vision here that we're hoping that people will start adopting and picking up and really start using threat modeling for more than what it is right now, right? So going back to the problem we're speaking about, right? We want to we wanna come up with this approach that really allows you to scale without slowing you down. So what do we want? We want something. We want a process that will minimize your network effect, right? That is, con uh, that is consistently reproducible. So the number of times you run the process, it's going to give you the same output. It's dependable. You know what it's going to give you. So we want something like that. We want a way to deal with these exception policies that can become a nightmare when your application grows, right? We want something that is up to date, so has the latest coverage of all the threats. We want a systemic view of our threat model, something that looks across the organization and tells you where your vulnerabilities are with prioritizing, right? And we want something that's realistic. We don't want a five-year-old making a Santa's wish list for a private jet, right? Obviously, like, that's not going to happen. We want something that's realistically achievable right now or in the near future. And finally, we want to be able to deal with this whole artifact disparity problem, this translation thing that tends to slow you down. We want to be able to better handle that. So now we know what, what we want. How do we get there? To break it down and keep it really simple, what we need to do is we need to create a scalable process that works across many systems and uses a common artifact. Now take this uses a common artifact with a pinch of salt. You could use a common artifact or you could design a super intelligent way of translating different artifacts. The implementation is up to you, but this is basically what you want to get at, right? So where do we begin? Every time we speak of scaling your threat modeling or scaling anything, we have to take automation seriously, right? Automation has to play a part. So we have to think along the lines of automation to even begin thinking how we're going to scale efficiently. Number two, we want to really think about system abstraction. Now, what do I mean by system abstraction? This is pretty much a play on words here, but it's the same idea where you're able to associate vulnerabilities first at a system level and then nest below to specific implementations and their vulnerabilities. So by doing that, you pretty much get a hierarchy of what's going on, right? And finally, you want to be able to data share. You should be able to share data across different parts of your organization in the most efficient way without people having to constantly intervene and slow you down and so on and so forth. So this is where we need to start. So let's talk a little bit about how we would achieve these different things or what, what's going on with these things right now. So we start with data sharing, right? Now data sharing is critical for security to, to succeed in any organization. And it's pretty much being done right now. Now this diagram might look a little complicated and convoluted, but what I'm, the basic idea here is you have things like weaknesses, you have standards, and you have compliance regulations. Now from an organization's perspective, if they are to just care about how compliant you are, they, they would just care about how compliant you are with all the regulations. So how do we get compliant with the regulations? You're compliant with the regulation if you've addressed all the standards underneath it, right? Now how do you address the standards? Oh, you address a standard if you've mitigated all the weaknesses associated with it, right? So these different models altogether need to communicate somehow to work on an organization's level. And this is kind of happening right now, right? Obviously, people do know, there are people who know if they're compliant or not. So this is not some new thing we're proposing, right? But the point I'm trying to get at is if we actually focus a little bit on how we are data sharing, that effort to to smoothen out this process is well worth the benefits you get later on. So putting a bit of process in how you're sharing data, identifying the areas where you experience friction and addressing those 
really makes it worthwhile eventually, right? It saves a lot of time in the long run. System abstraction, right? And we spoke about this again a little bit. We, we, we touched on a few areas. The idea here is you have, you have these different components, right? You have these different components in your organization. You might have a payment module, you might have a user data module, a web services module, a CRM module, things like that. So ideally what you want is you want your threat modeling to first just take a pass at the components on a system level, right? And then associate vulnerabilities on that level. You then, as an organization, will identify which of these components are most critical to you. Now, you really care about the payment and user data, for example, more than anything else. You then dive into further detail for those components, and you get uh, implementation-specific vulnerabilities at that level, right? So by doing something like this, you are really eliminating large parts of tasks and threat modeling approaches and threat modeling data that you might not need straight off the bat. Something might be an 80% critical value and something might be 5%. And you should be able to eliminate those and prioritize accordingly, right? So by doing something like this, you would kind of minimize the network effect even. So what is this big approach we are driving towards, right? Like we've spoken about so many things that we want, how we begin, where we start. So what is this final solution that we feel that will help you scale? So think about this. Think about a mapping that you have that maps all your systems to its vulnerabilities on a nested level, right? So the outer level would map systems to their vulnerabilities, and then you would nest inside those with uh, implementation-specific vulnerabilities. So for example, the outer level would map CRM to a list of associated vulnerabilities on that, and then underneath you would have Salesforce-specific vulnerabilities or something else. So you have this mapping, right? You take this mapping and you throw it on top of your system architecture, and you straight away get a prioritized list of all the vulnerabilities that you are exposed to. You then look at those vulnerabilities, and you can very easily eliminate the areas that you don't need because you have a system-wide overview. And then you can start creating all the dev tasks of areas that are of most interest to you, right? So by doing something like this, what are we gaining? Like I said, by having the system-wide overview or this Hawkeye view, you are minimizing the network effect, right? And because this mapping uh, is being thrown out of the system and the mapping is being maintained and it's the same, you would always get the same result. How many other times you take the mapping and throw it on top of your system, unless the mapping is changed or the system is changed, you will get the same output. So it's consistent, right? The exception policies would also get handled in the same way because your mappings now, your mapping becomes a single source of truth, right? So everything would be translated through that. And now with the point of latest coverage, what's becoming is the team, your security team now, the only job it has is to keep this mapping up to date. It doesn't have to run around doing translations, verifying someone else's work, uh, eliminating false positives. It doesn't have to do any of that. It just has to focus all its efforts on keeping this mapping up to date. And this is very realistically achievable, right? Because we're not proposing anything new. People already know all this information. We're just saying present it in a slightly different way that gives you all these additional benefits. So just make a JSON mapping and you get so many different benefits of doing it and looking at threat modeling from this perspective, right? And the part with artifact disparity, now this one's always very tricky, right? Uh, by and large, if you're using just this model, you do address the artifact disparity problem because now you're using a single artifact. But like I said, threat modeling approaches are never mutually exclusive, right? People still do other things along with this. And then you would run into that problem still. So it's an evolving problem. So this tends to address it to a large extent, but again, you know, you gotta keep evolving and keep developing and new approaches might come on and uh, so on and so forth. So any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, I think like there are some established taxonomies out there. Uh, if you look at OWASP, I think they have an open source thing as well that does list uh, a bunch of different classifications of uh, systems and their vulnerabilities. Um, I believe there are a few companies out there that have a few products as well that, that does this, some open source, some not. So yeah, it does exist, I guess, to answer your question. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, so uh, the question here is uh, just asking about the details of how the mapping would look in reference to systems and implementation specific things. So let's, let's, let's not look at CRM because that becomes too complex. We can look at something a little more simple, for example, right? Now imagine you have uh, your, your project is a web project. Now straight off the bat, your web projects are associated with certain vulnerabilities, right? So you start looking at those vulnerabilities on a web level, right? So you start off and the mapping would first, the outer level of the mapping would associate web with its vulnerabilities. And then inside, you would have specific vulnerabilities if you're using Django or Rails or Node or something else. And you would associate vulnerabilities with each of those on an implementation level nested below inside the, the web, let's say like a web JSON. Does that make sense? Kind of? Yeah. Yeah. The motivation to start with web coming because it's important that we know of, or is it coming from the x-axis or y-axis where a regulation or, or a standard that is driving that? So what drives the sequence in which we conduct the, the, the model? So think about it this way, right? You would, so you have this mapping. That you, you understand the mapping bit at least, right? So you have this mapping that maps systems to their vulnerabilities. And then let's say you have a questionnaire that you're answering. So when you're building your application, you're answering a questionnaire saying, I have a web project, and then I know inside I'm using Django, and then it also has a payment component, it has user data. So your, your questions are answered in a hierarchy form. And then the mapping just pretty much goes on top of those questions, and as in how you've answered those questions, specific sections of the mapping would light up. To add to his before my question, you have a, t a taxonomy that you could provide, you know, another mapping, like ER, instead of ER, uh, so sure, that, um, that's one point. Yeah, but you had said earlier, this is an application technique, but it sounds, it sounds very gen general, like you could have other forms of exposures, like networks. Yeah, okay. yeah, you could, you, could, you could grow this any way you like. You, right? you could also work for a company, therefore, who is off that grid, like a, like a, Firewall company, firewall protection company. Pretty make, much. Make money. Yeah, so there are lots of different companies that actually use this approach to threat modeling, right? And uh, the idea is you can pretty much grow it in the direction that you feel is most relevant to your organization. Now, like uh, Bob was saying, what Bob was saying? Bill. Ah, oh, my bad. Uh, so as Bill was saying, uh, you can, like for example, if you were a network company, a firewall company, you're more concerned with uh, growing your mapping in that direction, being more detailed, being more thorough, having many layers, many nests, right, to be able to answer questions in multiple different hierarchies. You want to grow in that direction, right? If you're a web company, if you're a payment company, you have the opportunity to really grow in a nested structure that gives you priority and details along the lines that are of most interest to you. Right, that, yeah. So I guess my question is like when this seems like it would only be applied to existing systems and not part of some kind of a development process where requirements would be mapped to it as well? I mean it would, right? Because uh, if you think about it, like I said, you are answering, like for example, let's go back to the web example, right? So now you're starting off with web and its associated vulnerabilities. Then you're saying, I'm gonna use Django, right? So then you're throwing Django in and you're getting vulnerabilities associated with Django. You can go a level below as well, saying inside Django, I am using these components, right? I'm using this authentication module, I'm using uh, LDAP, I'm using SAML, I'm using whatever, right? Like you can start throwing in questions at different levels and then associating vulnerabilities at those levels. But the idea is to look at this approach of associating vulnerabilities in a hierarchical manner, right? So you know where the vulnerability stands on a system level. It's not just an independent vulnerability out there, right? It's you know where it stands in the context of your organization, in the context of the threat model. We're trying to create priorities across each vulnerability that helps you eliminate and detail and map to allow you to help you grow faster. That's the main idea here. 
we're not presenting a lot of new information. We're just restructuring a lot of what we already have in a way that allows you to grow quicker. That's the main goal here, right? We're not saying we're going to make you more secure because a lot of these things are there already. People are doing these threat models. People are making these vulnerabilities found. They're doing these things. But the goal here is to try to scale. And we're saying that having priority will help you do that a lot. Because then you can start eliminating large chunks that might not be immediately relevant to you. So having that hierarchy, associating vulnerabilities with where they stand in the context of your organization. Uh, any more questions? Cool. So we're almost there, or as Dr. Strange would say, we're in the end game now. Uh, what do we have now? We have this mapping that's giving you all these different vulnerabilities nested inside with their priorities, so on and so forth. Can we make this better in any way? Now, I spoke about this a little bit earlier, how we want to expand the definition of threat modeling, right? So we've tackled most of these technical issues. The last bit that we feel that you can really add on here to give you the full effect is start associating business value with these threat modeling vulnerabilities. So you take this mapping and you have this hierarchy. Let's start throwing some more metadata in there. Let's start associating risk. Let's start associating compliance, right? Let's start putting these things inside our threat model. And finally now, you take this mapping, throw it on top of the system. You have a prioritized list of things you have to do. And in addition to that, you also, sorry, you also have your risk. You also know how compliant you are, right? You know the resiliency that you are at an organization level. You also know the dev tasks that you have to perform to fix these things. So you're getting the whole shebang here, right? And by doing this, like I said, first of all, you, you're increasing the number of stakeholders inside threat model. More people are invested in it, right? More people care now because they're getting something out of it that is of value to them. The business side will care about how compliant you are. They care about what the risk is. The tech side cares about what the tasks are. And everyone is getting everything. Now, if we remember like all the way at the beginning, I spoke about these different threat modeling approaches built with different motivations. And Dried was something that was approaching it from an attack vector perspective, and Dread was something that's approaching it from the risk management perspective. By doing something like this, you get both, right? So that is the idea that we are driving to it. We want to expand threat modeling, threat modeling to include as many stakeholders as possible to make it a stronger force. Um, any questions? Yeah, I was just wondering if how how much effort and time does this take and you know on a weekly or monthly or does it just depend on how you know how fast things are changing or how many how much time should you devote to this like you know if it's a small typically you know security professionals are way you know outnumbered by the development people and they can go and throw up all these systems really quick so it seems like this would take quite a lot of time. Can you give a perspective on how to manage that? Yeah, so there are different, like you don't have to start all by yourself. Like security is a very growing industry and there are a lot of practitioners and consultants and a lot of people out there. Like I don't know if you guys have heard of this concept of DevSecOps, right? It totally works on collaborating between different components together. This kind of aligns with those principles. We're really talking about bringing different teams under the same umbrella so that they're able to communicate more effectively. So that is the same principle that's driving our definition of threat modeling, right? So there are people out there that, are, that can give you starting points. You can even start with like OAuth has an open source uh, system that kind of does something very similar to what we're talking about, right? So that could be your starting point. Initially, you take something like that. It's open source. It's free. You understand where your organization stands in that perspective. If you're a more mature organization and you're looking for something deeper, there are other solutions out there for you. Right? So there are lots of different things. I'm happy to talk with you offline after, and we can dive into more detail. Uh, but the idea is you don't have to start from scratch here. There are people out there that have done a lot of work with these philosophies, and you can leverage that. Right? You can leverage that knowledge to get where you want to get. Security is a constantly evolving process. You cannot start running before you learn how to crawl. So it is a process where you have to evolve as an organization. You start small. Understand your requirements, understand your needs. As you're growing, then you can start maturing to better solutions, to more robust solutions. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Can you 
you comment about the automation? Yeah, absolutely. So basically, the idea of automation would become like the moment you have the sort of a mapping, right? So the mapping is consistent. Now, with, with the mapping being consistent, all you have to do is you have to automate the process of throwing the mapping on top of your system. No one has to manually go and design a data flow diagram anymore, right? It's very easy to par parse a JSON. JSON is just a listed, uh, a listed way of, or a nested way of representing information. So you can take this uh, nested structure and throw it on top of your system, and any developer or any organization should be able to automate that process fairly easily once you've maintained and created this map. type of system, for example, web. Yeah. If I have a web application or cloud service, and uh, it, what you're saying, if I understand it correctly, is basically a checklist. In the the sense, output? Right? If you, yeah, you say it's mapping, it's your two-dimensional map. Yeah. But if, for, if you look at it, each, each component, it's a checklist. Let's say you have a JSON, yeah. JSON file which listed all these potential vulnerabilities. Yeah. Your goal, what you, if I understand correctly, yeah. your goal is to check if my system is vulnerable to number one, number two, number three, and then you answer yes or no, right? Yeah, and, and then, then you would the have... Question, yeah, yeah, the question is, can you have a tool to automatically saying yes or no, right? And the, the, the system... Uh, it will be, have to be a very intelligent tool, right? Because your system can be as complex as you can build. Yeah, and that, typically that's a great the question. system will become uh, more and more complex. Yeah. And, yeah so I that, think I get your question. Yeah. So, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. In order to have something overall, like to really encompass everything, the, the system has to be relatively uh, intelligent. But you don't have to start off there. Right? You can start off by having partial automation where you're answering questions manually. So the work now becomes you look and you're answering the question saying, yes, I have a web. Yes, I have web services. Yes, I have payments. And then you throw that output into the mapping and the, like, the process of generating vulnerabilities is automated. Right? As you get more intelligent, as you, get, as you evolve more, the system, like the system that's doing the automation can become intelligent enough to identify the components themselves. But that will be at a later stage. You don't have to, that shouldn't be your starting point. No, it's not. So you're now looking, you're getting, so the simple yes and no stuff will be on a system level outside, right? Now if you determine for you, yeah. It, the questions don't have to be a yes or no question. That's the trick though, right? Everything is not a yes. You could have multiple choice questions. You could have many different types of questions. And I'm happy to talk to you after, actually. We have, uh, like, this actually is a great question, and we can discuss in detail. But the idea is the questions are not as trivial as is your thing a web application or a web service, right? You can have more complicated questions to suit, the, to suit your application, right? And you can design that the way you feel you need. And there are obviously solutions out there as well that have these. Like even OAuth, for example, the open source tool they have, their questions are, are fairly intelligent. They're not like yes, no questions, right? So they would ask you, like for example, if you have authentication, they would ask you what type of authentication. They would ask you if it's SAML, if it's LDAP, if you're using Django's auth, if you're using Rails auth. They would ask you more detailed questions. It could be multiple choice. It could be branches. It could be trees. A yes, no is just a very trivial way of explaining the concept of what you're trying to drive at. But yes, as, as the organization matures, as your 
security matures, you will need more complex tools to deal with it. But that cannot be your starting point, obviously, right? So I'm, I'm happy to talk to you after, and we can go into more detail with the Yeah, uh, hello. So the question that I have, I know you have created this map. Um, it's still, uh, I mean, your goal is to, to expand the threat model stakeholdership to a wider, you know, to the enterprise so that you have multiple, you know, people involved. But even if you took at it, I mean, this is kind of a fairly a big, you know, task. Say, if I just take NIST as one of the framework on your one side, I mean, there are 400 controls. You know, three to four hundred controls. When you add GDPR and maybe some other ones that the enterprise is interested in, and you are actually throwing all that stuff to so many people, I mean, to uh, evaluate, to figure out, you know, if it applies in that mapping. I mean, that's a humongous task. I mean, I don't know how, what it's practical experience task. you have in trying to implement this, uh, you know, philosophy. So it is a tremendous task if you're starting from scratch. But like I said, you don't have to start from scratch. There are people out there that are doing this work who can leverage that information. You're not building this from the beginning all by yourself, sitting in a boardroom overnight, not doing this alone. There are people out there that have been using this approach, right? This is being tried and tested in huge organizations, the largest of banks, biggest of tech companies. People are adopting this model. And there are open source solutions for you to get started off if you don't know if it's going to work for you. There are paid solutions that are a lot more comprehensive, right? So. What are your poster child children? You're alluding to the fact that you don't shouldn't worry because the big guys are somehow gathering their steam. I don't know whether they'll ever publish, but I, I can't uh, obviously list our clients. We have like NDAs and stuff, but I don't know. Is that what you're trying to get at? You're asking me which companies are using it? Like I can't really speak about the security posture of my clients in any way, but uh, I mean, there are, there, I mean, um, there, there are lots of organizations that are doing it right. The banks, I think, are out there that are really taking security in the most proactive manner right now. That I don't know. I have to, I have to verify with my, my team, but I'm happy to get back to you on that. DevSecOps, that's their buzzword. DevSecOps. People who align with DevSecOps philosophies will very easily adopt something like this because it directly uh, aligns with that idea of getting as many people under the same umbrella and dividing the burden of security across the organization, being a more holistic approach to looking at security than just your security team sitting and creating requirements, right? So the philosophy of DevSecOps is something that uh, really helps you understand that security is not the responsibility of just one team. Didn't we have the DevOps, SecOps thing last month? Was that? Thank you. My, memory, my memories. Yeah, maybe we should put these two together so that people. They oh, do. Altas is my director of research. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just want to comment that, uh, you know, my company, I'm in the process of taking them into a DevSecOps, you know, mode of operation. And there are a lot of challenges of doing that, right? Making people work together that, and there's different mindsets too, you know, as far as the developers, they want to fail fast and they want to fail all the time and I don't want to fail ever, right? But um, I feel like, uh, you know, it is a lot of work. I, I would say that it is. You know, it's probably a, quite a bit of work, but uh, and I feel like there's almost a little bit of, you know, apprehension of doing more work because we're also multi 
passed out, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you know, I feel like, you know, it's our job to discover these vulnerabilities, right? So if we're not, you know, diving deeper and ever deeper in an ongoing and just, it's just work, you know, you yeah. just got to, it's a job. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of work that's, that's right, but you have to understand one thing. Your, if your organization is going to grow, right, and you're trying to scale your security model to that growing organization, if you think big picture, long term, having the investment right now will save you a lot of time later down the road, right? So either you spend the time now trying to work and create a scalable process, or you don't spend that time now and you struggle later on when your organization grows and then you run into all different kinds of problems. That's, that's a discussion that you need to have or people need to have within their organization to understand what their priorities are right now. If your priority is you're at the cusp of growing and you are experiencing a lot of difficulty scaling your threat modeling, then you might want to think about an approach like this because that will really help you speed things up, right? And the investment of time, effort, money, whatever, people, man, man hours, right now will be probably well worth the investment later down the road. And that's the idea we are trying to drive here. It might not be for everyone. It might not be a solution that everyone cares deeply about because it's not a problem everyone is facing. But if you are resonating with this issue, that you are having trouble scaling your cybersecurity, then this approach might be something to really consider more seriously. I think uh, one good thing about he's trying to say is uh, instead of uh, each um, each party doing their own, uh, I don't know if this is what you tried to say. If each party do it their own secure threat modeling, uh, you have a collective view. For example, uh, we don't uh, like in my company we focus on risk assessment. And that, which is similar, uh, I mean, in the concept, uh, threat modeling is part of the risk assessment. So we focus on the risk. So we start with business asset. So we know what we want to protect. So we start from there. And then we do threat modeling, estimate risk, and so on and so forth. However, uh, very typically, uh, for example, R&D will do their risk assessment on the design and then later doing security testing on the implementation, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a comp compliance team. They will do that. And then the operation will do, you know, uh, different uh, auditing, uh, different parties doing different things. Uh, with uh, uh, his suggestion, you put all these together, make a list. And because some of the, uh, the, the checklists, uh, for example, from the auditing, and that will overlap with, uh, let's see, uh, for the authentication will overlap with some of the, the NIST control, will, which overlaps with OWASP some item. And then you can combine it into one item, which everyone can, uh, can understand. So it's more of a collective way of uh, thinking instead of sequential thinking. I think that's probably something we can all consider. I mean, think about it at least. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's one part to it. And the other really big advantage is uh, you have something like, at least with DevSecOps, right, we focus a lot with uh, collaboration in the sense we want everyone speaking the same language. Now, the language spoken by compliance and audit people is very different from the language spoken by developers. Now, if someone came to me and I was a developer like a year ago and they came to me and they gave me and they said, can you make your component uh, secure by this ISO standard? I would be lost. I wouldn't know where to start. Right? So the idea of DevSecOps is having a system where everyone's able to speak the same language. So it does that translation for you where the standard is translated directly to a dev task. And as that dev task is being done, the compliance people are looking at it, and from their lens, they see that, oh, we're compliant now because we're compliant with the standard. The dev people don't care about the compliance side. They're looking, okay, these are the tasks I need to do, and this is the priority level for each of them, and I can prioritize my work accordingly. So everyone's looking at it from their lens, and they see what they want to see, which kind of helps with that communication problem that people face within the organization, right? So I'm just going to like finish up real quick, and then we can spend the remaining time on questions. I have like one or two more slides. We're almost there. So let's just summarize this whole approach. And we've obviously spoken about a lot of these things uh, via the questions, but just a quick summary, right? 
So this approach right now is in practice in some of the biggest global companies. They are using this model and they're using it very successfully, a lot of them, right? Uh, this idea aligns with the buzzword DevSecOps, which is this new up and coming strong force inside the security field, right? It creates a constant feedback loop between audit and development, right? Everyone is able to be part of that same process. It still allows you to use traditional ways of threat modeling. We're not saying that use only this. By all means, go ahead and throw stride on top of areas where you still feel you want to do it, right? This is not mutually exclusive. You can use this as a security blanket on top of everything else. And finally, it provides business stakeholders with traceable information to risk. So it's kind of giving you pretty much everything that you need from an organization's perspective to grow. And just to sign off, uh, there's a case study by PayPal that has adopted this methodology over 400 teams across the world, right? And they've experienced great success with it. Uh, it's a half an hour long uh, presentation case study thing. Uh, anyone who's interested, reach out to me, and I will be more than happy to share this and send this over to you guys. Uh, and finally, thank you so much for listening to me go on and on about threat modeling for so long. And you guys have been a super engaged audience, which is awesome. And I'd be happy to like, you know, talk to you guys now after, take any questions, send you guys a follow-up. Yes, questions. thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, we're right at 1 o'clock. So if you have questions, if you can just come up here and talk to them individually. Otherwise, uh, sorry. Uh, so I do have uh, a colleague of mine. He's a uh, sales director from Security Compass. He works out of Texas here as well. So if you guys have specific questions about the implementation specific things and how you can buy or you can look at products that might help you, he's your man to go to and speak to. If you have technical questions or anything I just said, please come and speak to me and I'll be happy to help. Thank you, Fernand. Aww. And I uh, hope to see everybody at LastCon. Otherwise, we'll see you next year. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we just uh, leave the PayPal slide on this one before in case people just want to, one more? Yeah. Thank you so much. Do you, like, I, I don't think I, let me.